Hello, everybody, and welcome to the U.S. Uh, Nation at Risk. I'm Peter Schechter, and my colleague, Moody Jensen, and I are happy to host for this second time a special edition of Altamar with Hopkins at Home. This is a live version of our bi-weekly podcast, where along with Tay Ivanovich, we navigate world politics from a global perspective. In partnership with Johns Hopkins University, we're going to discuss today the growing security challenges that the United States faces over the next decade. Where are they going to come from? Are we ready for them? Where, what are we doing to meet these challenges? And we have a great guest to try to throw some answers and some light on these issues. John McLaughlin is here with us. He is the Distinguished Practitioner in Residence at SAIS, former Acting Director of the CIA and World Expert on Security. Enough said, right? I'm sure you're convinced, just like we're convinced, that he's the right man to answer both your and our questions. It is a great pleasure to be here again. And I'm Mooney Jensen, and Peter and I are going to warm up the subject. So it seems that risks are multiplying every day, from growing tensions with China to cyber attacks from Russia to threats from North Korea and the fallout from Afghanistan. Really, the world does not feel friendly. And even after smoothing out some ruffled feathers with France, sitting at the table with the G20 a couple of weeks ago and hopeful sounding COP26 pledges, it does seem that the U.S. is increasingly on the defensive. The U.S. government's recent move with Australia and the U.K. to offer to offset the inroads China has taken in the Pacific, the outreach to allies like India to create a barrier to Russia, and the country's vague kind of building back better slogan often sounds like a country really making an effort to retrench. You know, Muni, I think it's a, it's a worrisome picture. You know, Foreign Affairs published a great piece on this called The New Cold War, warning of a much more dangerous rivalry with China and the U.S. And it's clear that China has a start on this. COVID's impact on cybersecurity can't be un overstated. Teleworking fractured networks and made businesses and governments even more vulnerable to hacks and data threats and breaches. And in the US, disruptions to supply chains now and health networks are, you know, a dime a dozen. This is the front page of every single newspaper. And security experts have identified that Russia and China are the countries to a large extent of origin of a lot of those hacks and attacks. It's, it's, uh, it's it, the situation sort of grows more complicated all the time. And that there are other facets as well. And just this month, we read about a credible threat of terrorism by ISIS in neighboring Virginia, which threw a whole suburb into a panic and made us really reflect on how this terrorism threat could happen so close to home. And then while North Korea hasn't made any waves in recent weeks, that doesn't mean it's been silenced. And officials reacted to South Korea U.S. military drills and promised to, um, to retaliate. And the Iran-U.S. agreement has kind of gone cold, reminding the world of the ever accelerating Iranian moves to enrich uranium and to build nuclear weapons on the part of Tehran. So even as the US tries to assert American leadership around the world, domestic extremists continue to worry security experts. And not, not only um, the January 6th attack on the Capitol, it showed Americans that its institutions are not bulletproof, that its identity can crumble, that its model based on freedom and equality is fragile. Domestic extremists, violent acts, internal clashes are growing, breaking down the walls of its democracy. And more than ever, domestic terrorism needs to be taken very seriously. You know, we're doing this laundry list of things and it seems endless, but I'm going to add just one or two laundry list things that I think are important to sort of queue up as we invite our guests to speak. You know, you had these sonic attacks on embassies, phishing problems, phishing with a PH problems, data breaches, attacks on allies, hacked elections, threats and provocations. These are things that are happening all over the world and I don't want to leave out one of the most insidious security threats to humans everywhere, which is climate change, because as we talk about these things, we have a such a large meeting going on in Scotland about climate change. The U.S. defense and intelligence services long ago mobilized on the cl climate change issue and its effect 
an effect in accelerating migration. I mean, there are more people on the move today than ever before in history on financial stability, given the insurance problems that are that uh, accrue with that rising seas and what that means for the long-term viability of, I don't know, naval bases or our key ports, and of course on human safety. So with all this laundry list, Mooney, this is a great time to talk about uh, this fragile world with somebody who knows a lot about it. John McLaughlin is the Distinguished Practitioner in Residence at the Merrill Center for Strategic Studies at the Paul Nitza School of Advanced International Studies, SICE of Johns Hopkins University. In 1966, graduate of Johns Hopkins SICE, he served as Acting Director of Central Intelligence from July to September of 2004 and held multiple top-level posts at the CIA for over 30 years, focusing on various regions, including Europe, Russia, Eurasia. In addition to earning his master's degree in international relations from SICE, Johns Hopkins, he's an alumni of the US Army Infantry Officer Candidate School at Fort Benning and completed a US Army tour in Vietnam from 1968 to 69. He is the recipient of several awards from the intelligence community, has been a visiting professor and a member of multiple advisory groups worldwide. Professor John McLaughlin, it's an honor to have you on Altamar. Oh, thank you, Peter. Good to talk to you. So let's, let's uh, ask maybe the simplest question first. What is the top security risk for the United States in the coming decade? You know, listening to your list earlier, <laughs> for the first time, I began to think about that question, what is the top thing? And I'd make two general comments to frame that. Uh, listening to your list, uh, it occurs to me that one of the rules of success in life generally, and certainly in foreign affairs, is success comes to those who focus. Because you can, you can go down a list like that, and you can run from issue to issue to issue, and never really get much done. You have to focus. And the second thing is, the United States is in I think a unique position that we've never been in before. If you think back to the moment when we emerged on the world stage, World War II, you know, what we've dealt with most successfully are situations where we were looking for total victory over someone with no second act, like the Nazis, or for that matter, the Cold War. Total victory, no second act, they went away. That's not going to happen again. And so we are in a world where we have genuine competitors for the first time, really for the first time, and across the board, potential, and some would say already peer competitor in China. So when I think about the most serious problem and I focus, I would say it really is getting our relationship with China right, because that ripples across all of these other issues that you mentioned, dealing with Iran, dealing with North Korea, dealing with climate change, dealing with pandemic, if the two most powerful, wealthiest nations in the world do not have a working partnership of some sort, along with their adversarial dimension, all, all of these things are just going to um, fester and continue to be a problem. So that's kind of my first principle is get this relationship right. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about the US and China. And, and, and you know, there've been these articles about this new Cold War and, and how, yeah. How similar is it to the original Cold War? I, I, I think that's a bad metaphor to apply to the relationship with China. I would never do that. Uh, in fact, Joe Nye of Harvard just wrote a, a long and impressive uh, op-ed making that point, that Cold War is the wrong metaphor. And uh, he's striking themes that I've stri struck in print as well, which is, you know, Cold War, going back to my first point, this was, this was a time when we fought someone to the end. Someone had to win. Someone had to go away. They were the one who lost. They went away. It's not going to happen with China. Plus, it was a declining power. China's a rising power. Uh, let me just leave it at that on the Cold War metaphor. Uh, also, well, I, I could go on, but I'm leave it at that. But I would say with China, you've got to really, here's the way I approach problems. I say, what are the realities? What are the realities we're dealing with? I'm on that end of the foreign policy analytic spectrum. And I think with, with China, uh, let me give you four realities that I think. There are no easy answers. It's complicated. That's the first thing. Whereas with the Soviet Union, it was pretty black and white. And with World War II, pretty black and white. Second, we can't spend our way to superiority as we have in the past. Um, 
China will be, if there's no great discontinuity, the world's largest economic power within a number of years, um, maybe already are in terms of purchasing power parity. Third, no one really wants a war with China, I hope. I hope maybe someone does, but at, you know, I don't think anyone really wants a war with China. And fourth, you know, a real partnership with China is uh, not a, a likely foreseeable outcome in the, you know, in the immediate future. So where does it leave you? I think with three big strategies. First, deterrence. You've got to have deterrence and deterrence in this case complicated. Again, you can't use the Cold War metaphor, but deterrence, I think, involves mainly using alliances as force multipliers and messaging. I was encouraged just this week to see that the European Union is now open to the idea of sending messages to China about being careful with Taiwan, adding, in other words, adding to the international pressure to just cool it. Uh, second big thing, uh, enhance our bilateral engagement. And I think the Biden administration seems to be trying to do this. You know, military to military, diplomat to diplomat, intelligence to intelligence. It doesn't mean you have to be friendless. You just have to communicate. Churchill said it best, jaw jaw is better than war war. And third, take a look at our governors here at home. We, have, we can't make decisions in any sort of efficient way. Look at our Congress now, stalled, struggling, partisan deadlock. That doesn't happen in China. We're dealing with a system where decisions are made pretty quickly. Uh, airports come and go, railroads come and go. <laughs> now, we don't want to be an authoritarian society, but we've got to streamline our decision making here if we're going to be competitive. So those are my thoughts on, on how we get things straight with China. No easy answers, though. I have so many questions, but I'm not, I'm going to be disciplined and and. Oh yeah, we can peel, we can unpeel all those China things. They 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 are all rabbit holes that we could go down. Absolutely. But deterrence, Absolutely. for example, Absolutely. deterrence has three C's: communication, credibility, capability. We could talk about all three of those. Credibility, for example, have we hurt ours? I think we probably have. Yeah, let's move to Russia. As I'm sure I'm sure we'll get an audience question on. China, so we'll, we'll be coming back to this. Let's move to Russia. Is it still a major threat to the United States? I mean, particularly security, and then let's move to cybersecurity. You know, it's really interesting. Russia is so interesting. The last time I was in Russia, which was now, I guess, 2018, and I'd been there in 2016 as well with uh, a group that um, we were doing what you'd call track two, that is having discussions with the Russians on uh, matters uh, that the that concern are both of our governments, but we weren't government officials, former government officials. I was walking down the street in Moscow with a veteran diplomat, and I said to him, you know, why is it that we keep coming here? The economy of this place is about the size of Portugal. What, what is it about Russia? And he said something to me that really stuck. We were looking, it was a rainy, <laughs> uh, ugly night in Moscow, although beautifully lit. Uh, Mo Moscow looks a lot better than it did in the Cold War days. And he said, you know, we say they're not a powerful country, but they keep showing up. And that's true. They keep showing up. I think we have to treat Russia as a serious power. And I think Biden actually made some headway on that in his meeting with Putin at Vienna, simply by treating him as a serious interlocutor, as opposed to just beating them up. They're a little beating up, too, on cyber and so forth. But so what is, here's, here's the secret of dealing with Russians. This comes from just my dealing with them. They always know what they want. And so you better know what you want because they're good at chess. And I know what they want and what Putin wants. Putin wants three things. He wants control at home, wants to heavily influence his neighbors. He wants to weaken the Western alliance. And fourth, I guess, is a fourth thing. He wants to be seen as a great power on the global stage. Why else is he in Libya, Africa, Syria? Now, what do we want? What's our desired end point with Russia? I think I'm reading Biden's meetings with him as saying our desired end point is not a friendship or partnership, but it's kind of clarity in where we stand, where they stand, and cooperation when it's uh, when it's important. 
uh, I've read, I don't know whether to take this seriously yet because I'm not in the government. I've read that uh, Putin has offered access to some uh, or encouraged uh, neighboring countries of Afghanistan to give us some access so that we can have a closer window into Afghanistan. I don't know whether that's a serious offer or uh, you know, propaganda game playing and so forth. But certainly we can cooperate with the Russians on climate change, on uh, uh, terrorism and so forth. But just be aware, they know what they want and what they want is not what we want. So again, uh, difficult relationship. And Professor, I wanted to ask you um, more to go more in depth about cybersecurity. Um, yeah. What are some of the main cyber challenges that we're facing right now? And how do we go about protecting the country from them in an increasingly more digital world? Well, that's probably the biggest uh, issue we could discuss. And uh, in, in a short period, I would simply say, you say, what is the biggest challenge? In a way, the biggest challenge is organizing ourselves to deal with it, because it's unlike any problem we've dealt with before. Uh, it has become what I would call a fourth domain of conflict. Prior to the technological revolution that brought us cyber, the domains of conflict were centuries old. Um, sea, land, air, not so much centuries old, but uh, certainly going back to balloon observation in the, uh, in the Civil War, but, and then of course, air power in World War I begins. Now we have this fourth domain of conflict in a world we can't quite see, a, a world of fiber optic cables and, and, uh, and, and microwaves. Uh, so it's different in that respect. It's different too, in that it's not just nations who are playing, it's also private citizens, hackers, it's small groups of people, it's uh, ransomware people. So people, we can't solve it by dealing with other countries exclusively. And, and the other thing is when I say getting ourselves organized, it's the, I, I'm encouraged by one thing. Uh, in this administration, there is now a, uh, a mechanism for connecting government because the capability to fight cyber attackers resides largely in an organization called the National Security Agency. Now, the National Security Agency has a, an online platform for collecting and reporting to companies and receiving from private sector reports of hacking and so forth, so that you start to bring government tools together with private sector problems. This has been a major Im impediment to making progress on cyber, that a lot of the problem is in the private sector, but a lot of the capability is in the government, though there are some impressive private sector firms like CrowdStrike that are uh, probably the equivalent of government. But when it comes to fighting back, that, that's mostly in the government, US military and national security agencies. So those connections are now starting to weave together a bit because the uh, person heading this at the White House Chris Inglis is a former 17 year uh, deputy director of the National Security Agency, one of the smartest people I ever worked with. So that, there's that. Then there is the issue of, um, I'm gonna stop here because this is again, one of those endless things. There's the issue of um, how do we think about escalation? If you strike back at say another country that's engaged in a cyber attack, well, where does it stop? Now we, we understand that in conventional war, it stops when the other person's stuff is destroyed and when, the, the, you know, as Clausewitz, Clausewitz the, the German uh, Prussian uh, theoretician said back in the 19th century, uh, defeat the enemy and occupy his territory. Uh, we understand that. You don't do that in cyber. H how do you win? Where does it stop? Uh, what is a counter strike? Uh, we, that's all to be determined. Plus, we haven't had cyber Pearl Harbor. Came close with the uh, hack on the uh, mm. Dominion pipeline. That got people's attention. But we haven't had that event that says, oh, wait a minute, as a country, like 9-11. 9-11 woke us up to terrorism. We haven't had that event with cyber. So I, I, I'm going to stop there and just, I guess I, my basic message is this is a whole new era we just beginning to explore. I, I actually compare it to the beginning of the nuclear age. You know, we didn't know what to do with nuclear weapons, how to talk to others about them and so forth, but we figured it out over time with arms control and uh, inspections and so forth and transparency and declarations. 
we're at the, we're, we're at the, uh, the front end of that whole process with cyber. And then came COVID, which in itself is uh, starting to be considered a, a geopolitical risk just yeah. because of all the transformations in, in our daily lives. And it was already considered, cyber was considered a significant risk before COVID, but everyone at home has opened up vulnerabilities in business and government networks that have been used already by adversaries, opening up an entire new um, threat and an entire new line of this, um, you know, of, of this risk that is only just now being um, understood. Well, you, you know, your, your remark underlines something we haven't really talked about, and that is, I think, kind of on the frontiers of thinking right now, and for which you could not get a majority of support almost anywhere. But here, here's my thought. When you look at COVID and cyber in particular, and COVID is not the last pandemic we will deal with, uh, and you, you look at uh, nuclear problems generally and terrorism, all of these things cry out for a global response. And yet our global um, machinery is devised in another era uh, after World War II and rather creaky, creaky and not very well supported in, in public opinion or economically. Uh, so I think in, in a way, uh, you, you, you we're almost ripe for a new idea about how to work together globally. I don't know what it is and I, but it, you know, the United Nations was a following on to the League of Nations was a, a striking new idea appropriate to its time. We need something like that right now because all of these problems, you know, the United States is the most powerful country in the world, but it's long past the time when it can do things by itself. On the other hand, we haven't arrived at the time where other countries can do things without the United States. That's a kind of unique situation that we've never faced before. And I don't think we have the machinery globally to deal with that yet. Speaking so that's of just that's just me admiring the problem, not giving you a solution. Well, so, and, and I was going to get into something even more concerning domestically is how health sectors, supply chain software and infrastructure, energy and food supply. It's already happened, but it could happen at a much greater scale. Um, in terms of attacks that could destabilize the world economy. So the question initially that I had before hearing you is how the, can the U.S. protect itself? But now that you're talking about this global response, how can the world respond to this threat? Well, you have to start, you know, at the beginning I said uh, the success comes to those who focus. And uh, here I think the focus has to be on global cooperation, but it also has to be realistic as someone pointed out the other day, you know, with the climate uh, summit, uh, how we have these well-articulated goals and solutions, but how can we really expect countries to work together harmoniously and efficiently when we can't even get our own citizens to wear masks or take vaccinations? So how does my first comment apply to that focus? Well, I think this requires a kind of leadership that has never happened before, which is something that communicates to publics that we, we have these problems, uh, people, leaders who can communicate to publics, we have these problems, and it's going to take a while to, to solve them. We are, particularly in the United States, accustomed to um, rapid fixes to things. You know, we elect a president every four years. Um, China elects one every 25 years, it seems. So we are on a different, you know, we, our national leadership needs to, needs to bring us into an era of maturity that we haven't achieved yet in terms of patience and understanding. These problems aren't going to be solved overnight and we're not going to solve them ourselves. We have to keep beating on the frontiers of cooperation with other countries. So it's important at the climate summit that China and the United States have jointly agreed to reduce um, emissions that contribute to rising global temperatures. Now, the immediate press reaction is, yes, but this is almost impossible. They won't really do it. Well, they won't do it all overnight, but I suspect it's better to have that agreement than to have no agreement. In other words, 
one of the things I learned in government is uh, important change happens at the margins. By that, I mean, you never solve the big problem overnight. You solve parts of it and gradually you narrow, narrow it until the point where you have it working. Obamacare might be a good example of this. Remember how a disaster it was in the first year? Website didn't work. Everyone was unhappy. For four years, Trump tried to get rid of it. Now it's sort of seen as a good thing. Not perfect, but a good thing. That's kind of how this is going to go for the next couple of decades, I think. You know, we're not going to stamp out COVID, but we'll get it to the point where we can work, we can live with it at a lower level. We're not going to ever eliminate terrorism totally. It's been there since biblical times and before at some level, but we can get it to the point where it's, it's a nuisance more than a uh, earth shaking event for the world. Uh, so uh, that's, um, again, I'm kind of admiring the problem, but I'm also saying we're in a different era. You know, we're not in the era when the United States could fight and win a war in four years. It was pretty amazing, World War II. We're not in that era. But we haven't been in that era for a while. I mean, Vietnam Correct. Was, Vietnam was uh, certainly no example of that. The, Excellent, the, absolutely. You know, you, you talked, uh, Professor, about, about the importance of leadership that in the United States and for leadership to be, to try to galvanize a, greater public support through patient explanations of the problems that we have. But, you know, I, I, how does that work with what we saw in, on January 6th of this year, which shows that the vulnerabilities that, I mean, the security risks that exist in the United States are not only from overseas, but also so very domestic today. I mean, the United States has certainly seen that before, but I don't think it has ever seen it so blatantly since the civil war and uh that's right well all these all these books behind me you know when you look at a book on ir theory somewhere there's always an international relations theory there's always a chapter on that says uh domestic and foreign policy are related right right but you know i, I remember that from size you remember that <laughs> well it turns out to be true <laughs> in other words for the first time in my lifetime it's vividly true it's always been true, but it's vividly true now because, um, you know, our international power is so closely related to our domestic well-being. If you look at, um, you know, global opinion of the United States as measured by the surveys of the Pew Organization, it, it has been falling pretty steadily uh, over the last 30 years, really. And that's our soft power. So we, we always think in terms of hard power, you know, our military balance with China or Russia and so forth. And that's important. But I've always thought with the United States, uh, equally important is our soft power. That is what the United States is fundamentally an idea. And, uh, you know, for a long time, 70% of the box office receipts for American movies were overseas, may still be, I haven't checked that lately, but that's our soft power, our culture, what people think of us. A friend of mine who goes to Iran quite often says that on the street in Iran, as distinct from the government, America's uh, more popular than at any place in the Middle East, other than maybe Israel. Um, but that's not the government view in Iran. And so that's our soft power. And we have, to we have to attend to that. And our soft power right now is suffering badly because of what the world sees going on here. How can you be a representative how can you be the beacon of democracy when your own democracy is literally under assault within your own country? So it's important that you know, I don't want to get into politics, but because I, you know, I suspect that this the point we've arrived at is the result of bad politics for more than four years. Uh, we, we need to somehow fix this. Uh, the last time I wrote a paper on you know, U.S. foreign policy, this was one of my major themes that to a large degree, if we don't deal with the partisanship in our own country, we're, we're not going to have, we're going to lose our power overseas because it is mostly soft power. 
you know, backed up by hard power, but it's mostly soft power. And uh, I'm not the one to say how we do that because I've spent most of my life looking at other countries, but I'm start, I've seen in the last years, some of the most alarming attributes you see in other countries are starting to appear here. Right. That's the scary thing. In fact, people used to ask, I wrote an op-ed once on, I was being asked, why do former intelligence officers speak out? Because I you know, have spoken out a lot in the last four years. And the, the point of it was, aren't you guys supposed to be non-political and neutral? Yes. And I haven't spoken out with too much lately, but my, I wrote an op-ed that said, the only reason we're doing this is that we're starting to see as intelligence officers who spent our lives focusing on problems overseas, we're now starting to see the things that threaten those countries begin to threaten our own country. That's why we're speaking out, uh, not just me, but a lot of others as well. Let's uh, bring our look back overseas. And you mentioned Iran. Um, certainly, um, Iran continues to be a major problem as it has signaled over and over again in the last year that it intends to continue enriching uranium. Um, how does one try to prevent that enrichment from reaching its final stage, which is the creation of a bomb? Uh, this problem is getting away from us. Uh, uh, there's news that the U.S. and Iran will be resume negotiations uh, soon. But now Iran having, since we left the agreement in 2017, 2017 or 2018, under the Trump administration, the 2015 nuclear agreement, Iran is now enriched, um, they, they tell us, there's no reason to doubt this, about 180 kilograms of uranium to 20% enrichment. When you reach 20%, it's a, it's a short leap to get to the 90% uh, range. Uh, getting to 20% is the hard part, but then it's a short leap to get to the weapons grade enrichment level. So they are now approaching what we call breakout, meaning having the conditions to quickly move to a, a functioning nuclear weapon. And I think this problem could get away from us because they're going to have very tough requirements in this negotiation. They're not going to want to just say, uh, OK, we, we can sign the same piece of paper again. They're going to want to add requirements to it, and we're going to want to add requirements to it. Uh, for limitation, I'm, I don't know this, but I'm guessing for limitations on missiles and other things. So I, I, I can't make any predictions here, but I, I would say, if I had to give odds, I would say the the odds are, you know, uh, you know, seventy thirty against us getting to an agreement with them, and I don't think they're going to brandish a nuclear weapon if we fail in these negotiations, I think they will stay hovering right at breakout, which is the worst possible world because they can claim not to be a nuclear weapon state, but we know that they can become one very quickly. This will leave the um, Israelis and the Saudis and others in that region very nervous. Although again, the politics of the Middle East is changing. That's the other, th that's another thing that, you know, we could put on your, your list. The, the politics is not revolving around the United States as it once did. They're starting to deal with each other a lot more. And, and uh, the, the UAE and the Saudis have started, you know, taking tentative steps toward Iran and vice versa. Nonetheless, if they get to that point again, there's going to be a strong regional desire to stop them and or to proliferate such weapons within the Middle East. And a country like Saudi Arabia could get there very quickly uh, with help of Pakistan. Um, so that's a bad problem. And, you know, but again, my first comment, things come to people who focus. That's why I am encouraged that the United States and Russia have begun negotiations in Geneva or Vienna within the last month or so, again, on uh, arms control beyond the New START agreement. Uh, when I was in Moscow the last time, we met with Sergei Ryabkov, who was the chief arms control person there in their foreign ministry. And he told us flat out, this would have been 2018, uh, President Putin has forbidden any negotiations at this point. Because we, we were saying, shouldn't we get back to this? At that point, the new START agreement was about to expire. 
He said, we're, we're not doing it uh, right now. And the fact that they've begun to talk, that we've begun to talk, tells me that whatever Putin and Biden did in Vienna uh, must have been must have been more businesslike and and serious than what had happened in the previous four years. So when I say focus, if we don't get that part of this nuclear equation right, we're we're sending the wrong message to countries like North Korea and Iran. They have to see the United States and Russia focusing on reductions of nuclear weapons as we are pledged to do under the non-proliferation treaty then we have some moral high ground to stand on when we go to the iranians without that the iranians say well you know you're not doing anything we're an independent country we can do whatever we want we've covered a lot of the external threats regarding countries we talked about china we talked about russia and iran and other um threats that are their country specific. And as we wrap up this great conversation, um, it, let's talk a little bit about other factors that are shuffling the global power structure that are transnational, like migration, climate change, and of course, the kind of atomization of terrorism as, as forces of instability. What do you believe are the main threats to global peace right now? Well, I think on that score, you have to look at a large global trends. And actually, the uh, intelligence community does this every five years. And thinking back, I was involved in it years ago and began that process when I was there. Thinking about the, the things I took away from it over years, these big global trends are the drivers here. Demographics, you know, the world population is increasing exponentially. It'll get to 8 billion within a couple of decades. Uh, most of this growth, uh, less than two to three percent, is in the developed world. Most of it, if you, if you had a map here and you put a big red dot where the development occurs, most of it would be in Africa, uh, South Asia, and parts of Southeast Asia. Countries like China, Europe, Japan, all aging. Uh, so those countries that are growing rapidly are also very young. The other big trend is urbanization. Uh, we're heading for to a world where like 65% of the world's population lives in cities, mega cities. So you add all of that up and you get the classic formula of governments growing, those governments that are less qualified to provide services to a growing demanding population. That in turn stimulates migration and uh, people migrate to places like Europe, the United States, uh, even Belarus lately, uh, tragically. So uh, I think those are the big drivers, uh, things that are a bit beyond our control. And then, uh, you know, add, add disease into that. And it, it takes you again, back at terrorism, let's look at terrorism. You know, I always think the way you deal with terrorism, that's what I did the last four years or so I was in government. You got to do three things. You have to destroy the leadership, you have to deny it safe haven, and you have to change the conditions that give rise to the whole thing. Well, what I've just talked about are among the conditions that give rise to it. And, you know, no intelligence agency can deal with that. That's an all of government, maybe all of globe problem. So we have to think about our coordinating our uh, development pro programs globally, our assistance programs globally, our humanitarian programs globally, uh, in order to uh, deal with those big trends like demographic change, urbanization, uh, migration, um, and you know, put climate change into the mix, uh, it also stimulates all of that because parts of the world, you know, three billion people in the world now don't have access daily to safe, clean water. It's probably going to grow, and people underestimate the role of water. Water is essential to life on this earth. And if you don't have access to clean, safe water, nothing else works. A uh, third of the world's surface is covered by uh, river, uh, what do you call that, that the, where, where they flow into the sea, river uh, deltas or something that are shared by more than one country. So again, that's a, that's a transnational problem, access to water. Um, Again, you know, I don't have solutions here. I feel like I'm admiring the problem when I go through all of that. But, but that's the starting point. Remember I said earlier, you have to start with the realities. That's, that's oh, kind you, of what I'm doing. You've done a great job of laying them out. Professor 
McLaughlin, we have a, a group of eager uh, participants that would like to start with their questions. So I'm going to turn it over to our colleague, Thea Ivanovich, and thank you so much for being on Altamar once again. Uh, thank you, Peter, and thank you. Thank you so much for this, this great conversation. Um, so I will now lead to the, um, the Q&A portion from the audience. Um, I wanted to let you all know um, who, are, who are tuning in that the podcast will be live next Friday. So that's November 19th. Um, and you can listen to the podcast wherever you get your podcast. So whether it's Apple or Spotify or something else. Um, and I highly encourage you to do that. And we're very excited um, about this conversation. So as you guys have already predicted, there are a lot of questions um, also about China. Um, and so I'm, 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 I'll, I guess I'll start with those uh, since we wanted to go a little deeper into that. So the first question is, are Western leaders uh, perhaps overestimating Chinese strength? There are various economic problems, demographic issues, ecological misfortunes, regional divergences, possible resentments by up and coming officials at Xi's um, high handedness and adventurism may be overlooked? Well, uh, that's a great question. And I, I would basically agree with the premise of the question that we may be overestimating um, China's power and China's strength. Uh, at the same time, I think we have to be careful not to take comfort in that. Because, um, and, and in a way, agreeing with the premise of the question is behind some of the things that I said earlier about China in terms of strategies for dealing with it. Notice, I didn't say, uh, just build up our military so that we can you know, stop them if they do something bad. It's more complicated than that. Um, the way I would put it is, I think our relationship with China is going to end up being some blend between adversarial partner and competitor. And we don't have a word for that yet. But the questioner is right. Uh, China has struggled to develop uh, demand domestically for its products so it can break away from the cycle of sustaining its economy with cheap exports. Uh, that's one of the things Xi has tried to do. Some would say his policies have been counterproductive in, get, in trying to get there because in imposing greater state control and greater party control, he, he's not loosening up the domestic market to the point that we in the West would think is important to allow for the innovation that is necessary. Um, I think the point about innovation is correct. Again, we, we have to not take too much comfort in it. Innovation is, I mean, the United States is among the, among the most innovative countries in the world, not the only one, but we do have a tradition in our universities and in a society generally to innovation because of our ability to let information flow and have free arguments and access to and transparency with data and information. China has so far been more successful at integrating technology than inventing it. But that's why I say don't take a lot of comfort in this. Integrating technology is also important. Some argue that they are ahead of us in certain sciences like biology. I think there's an argument on both sides in things like uh, artificial intelligence. Some say, some experts say we're ahead, some say they're ahead. Um, so yes, I, I, I would come back to the, well, uh, you know, again, the premise of the question, I think, is correct. We can We have a tendency to over, to see the Chinese as 110 feet tall, but let's not take comfort from the fact that they may not be as powerful and as surging as uh, some of the uh, imagery suggests, because they are still uh, a, maybe the most serious competitor we've had. Competitor. I'm not saying military adversary, but competitor. There's a, a question on, on the nuclear um, relationship and in particular on China. So the question is, can China be brought into a comprehensive test nuclear test ban treaty, the CTBT, bilaterally or perhaps in a multilateral effort? Well, the Chinese have resisted participating in uh, nuclear uh, agreements, international nuclear agreements. Uh, maybe a bigger question 
uh, than that. I mean, the, the test ban treaty is one, but I think uh, maybe a more urgent question has to do with whether we can bring them into the negotiations on the numbers of nuclear weapons that we possess and the ways in which we possess them. In other words, you, you could have a nuclear force that is uh, on alert to launch, which is the way we have ours and the Russians have theirs, which is scary. People forget how scary this is. And, and a couple of times in the Cold War, we came very close to misreading each other. Um, former secretaries of defense have some real horror stories about that, particularly Bill Perry, uh, secretary under Clinton. Uh, you know, ca calls in the middle of the night with, uh, you know, you got 30 minutes to decide whether that's an incoming or not. And uh, fortunately, we were able to figure it out. Bill Perry tells that story. Uh, but so it's scary what we, the way we are postured. Now, the Chinese, uh, are moving toward that, I think. And the recent news stories that they, uh, from the Pentagon, the annual report saying that they are going well beyond the 200 nuclear weapons we had projected and heading up to about 600 or so, the Pentagon thinks. Um, I don't, we don't yet know what that's all about, but it suggests to me, the the phrase that came to my mind was, we may be in a a competitive, a, a deterrence competition, if you will. In other words, no one really wants to use nuclear weapons, but they, but they can be used and they are mostly weapons of deterrence. And so I think they're, we're in a kind of, a, they wanna to get to the point where they have serious deterrent power over us. Although if you think about it, you know, a handful of nuclear weapons are deter and deterrence because our missile defense would have a hell of a time, difficult time, shooting down an incoming ICBM. It's a myth that we can just knock them out. It's too hard. Then you add into it the fact that hypersonic weapons are coming into the mix. Russia claims to have them. We have never seen Russia test them, but uh, I think it's prudent to assume they do. The Chinese are working on it. Uh, they had a test that some have interpreted as a hypersonic missile test. Well, what does that mean? Well, it goes five times the speed of sound, which, and, and if it's also maneuverable, it means that it's very hard for any defense to actually knock it down. It's also hard to detect it in time. It's also possible if you put a conventional warhead on a hypersonic missile, to know whether what you see as incoming is conventional or nuclear. So that's not included in any arms control negotiations that we currently are party to. So, um, you know, to the question that was asked, um, this is a multidimensional struggle with China right now. How do we get them in to a negotiation and how do we factor hypersonic weapons into this? And I think part of the way you get them in is to have a productive arms control relationship with Russia and to be seen doing that and to be praised for doing it by the international community. And then to, uh, after all, the Russians now have a number of um, agreements with China, it's another sort of subset of all these problems we've been talking about is a growing close relationship between Russia and China. They've done military maneuvers together. China has long drawn on the sophisticated uh, defense research capability of the Russians, particularly during a time when the Russians were flat on their back and needed money after the uh, breakup of the Soviet Union. Uh, it was really Chinese money that sustained their impressive defense research capability. So that, that relationship is there. Uh, there may be some way to build on that to encourage the Chinese to come in. But going back to my earlier point, this won't happen overnight. Uh, and it has to be the result of um, you know, a multi-pronged approach, diplomatic, military, uh, but mostly diplomatic. Um, you know, I, I 
went off in so many directions, I don't remember exactly what the original question was. But the, well, I, have a, I have a great actually follow up to that because you were talking about ahead. Russia and China, and there is a great question about that. And it's about cyber strategies and yeah. how the US activity in cyberspace compares to Russia and China. Uh, the question is, it feels like we mostly hear about breaches, but not about successful deterrence. Are we falling behind? Well, I don't think we know. Um, because this part of American policy is uh, deeply secret. Uh, I don't, I'm not in the government now, and it's not something that people talk about, but the most secret part of our uh, cyber policy is what we are doing offensively. That is, we have the capability to, uh, to, to do things offensively in our cyber. We're not, I mean, so I would, I, I don't, I, it would be, misleading for me to say, I think we're falling behind. I don't know, but I would be surprised if we were falling behind in terms of capability to strike. We may be falling behind in capability to defend because obviously they have gotten through. And again, who is they? You know, the Russians claim that the ransomware is not officially Russian uh, sponsored. We don't know that. I I give them about 50% credit on that, that it, it probably is done by some private hacker group. But in, in authoritarian societies, you never know. Uh, you know, in, in Nazi Germany, uh, which, you know, the ultimate authoritarian society, there, there was a phrase called working toward the Fuhrer working toward the Fuhrer. Uh, what did that mean? Well, it meant the Fuhrer didn't tell you to do it, but you kind of knew the Fuhrer would like the fact that you did it. So you were sort of working toward the Fuhrer's favor. Now, I suspect in Russia, there's a lot of that that goes on, you know, working toward Putin. You know, he's not sponsoring this. His fingerprints aren't on it but he doesn't mind that we're doing it. That's my guess as to how this works. And um, obviously they've gotten through. So our, our defense and, 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 and that solar winds hack, uh, that was where they tapped into um, a, you know, a system that many parts of the government and private sector were using and then it migrated out and got, in, got infected a lot of systems. It wasn't the U.S. government that detected that first, to my knowledge. If we accept the public accounts, it was a private firm. I forget which one it was, but it was one of these firms like CrowdStrike that detected it. So I, I, I think we're, uh, we're, we're maybe not where we need to be on defense, but I suspect we are where we need to be on offense. But here's the problem on offense. Go back to the point I made earlier about your, you have to think hard about when you strike, when you do something offensively. When does it become an act of war? Because it is a fourth domain of conflict. We, that's, not under, that's not internationally understood yet, really. Not, there's no agreement on it. And, and what does the other side do if you attack? I suspect they attack back. And where does that stop? We don't understand that yet. Whereas we do understand that, if you're battling at sea, you lose your ships. Battling on land, you lose your tanks, you lose your infantry. Battling in the air, your airplanes go down. We don't understand that in cyber yet. And I think this is also a great segue for the next question, which is kind of going back to that, uh, those real, quote unquote, real uh, battles on, on air and, and land. The question is about Afghanistan. Um, so the question is, we hear a lot about how the U.S. was taken by surprise by how the Afghanistan withdrawal played out. Does this indicate a need to rethink the future of information collection and evaluation? And I think this will be probably the last question. Um, maybe we'll have one more, but we do have to stop at one. Well, I know a little too much about that to give a complete answer. Um, and I would say, no, the problem is not information collection so much as it is what you do with it. And I think the, uh, 
uh, let, let me just say this. I think anyone with their eyes open could see that the just even on the basis of public information in the last several months, uh, say say in the last six months, anyone with their eyes open just reading the papers could see that this was going bad. Why was it going bad? Why why were Afghan units abandoning their weapons and abandoning their posts and 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 defecting and taking off their uniforms and going home? Why was that happening? Well, it's going to take a national commission to really look at that over 20 years. But I, the short answer might be, I think we were training a military there in our own image. That is a military that would be relying on information dominance, which is what we rely on. We, we know more about the battlefield than anyone else. Uh, relying on sophisticated equipment that required sophisticated maintenance that we took away, by the way. And... Um, and, and relying on military discipline in a society that as a society has very little unitary discipline. I mean, in, in our society, if you're in the army, as I was, you, you don't walk away, that, that's a crime. You, you, you are arrested, convicted, you're AWOL. In a country like Afghanistan, there was no, you could take your uniform off and go home. It wasn't that tradition. And then, why do you fight? People talk about the will to fight. And I said to someone the other day, you know, that's, that's a sterile phrase. What does will to fight mean? Will to fight means willingness to die. Because you're, you, you're, someone's going to die when you fight. Are you willing to die? Well, to be willing to die, you have to have a very clear idea of what you're going to die for. And Chances are it has to be a government you respect uh, that is not corrupt and or you have to have leaders who inspire you to take those risks. I'm reading the biography of Grant right now, which I encourage everyone to do um, by Ron Chernow. And what strikes me is Grant in the Civil War could lose 17,000 soldiers in a day in, in these uh, confrontations bloodier than anyone imagines today and still the next day have people marching into the next battle how did that happen leadership matters respect for your leaders matters he was a respected commander uh, the cause was respected some of that was missing in afghanistan somehow and it's so i put that down to you know poor a failure of national leaders in Afghanistan. Now, on the other side of the coin, if you're trying to excuse them, you could say no one in Afghanistan in its history has ever held sway over the entire country. You know, it's never been a unitary country. But, you know, I, I don't think we could have succeeded there unless we decided to just stay for a long, long time, not just 20 years. And I don't think that's not something the United States is prepared to do. Professor McLaughlin, thank you so much for your time and for this great conversation. Uh, we'll have to end it here. Uh, unfortunately, we couldn't get to all the, uh, the questions, um, but the Altamar team would like to thank you all um, and thank Hopkins at Home for this great partnership. This is our second um, partnership together and we hope uh, we look forward to many more. Um, as I mentioned, this podcast with Professor McLaughlin, the full podcast will go live next Friday. That's November 19th on Altamar. Uh, and you can follow us and sub subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts um, as well. And so that will go live next Friday. So we hope you'll listen to the entire podcast and we hope you have a great rest of your day.